episode 31. It's bewitched, said Hermione. If a muggle looks at all, all they see is a mouldering old ruin with a sign over the entrance saying, Danger, do not enter. Unsafe. So Durmstrang will just look like a ruin to an outsider too? Maybe, said Hermione, shrugging. Or it might have muggle-repelling charms on it, like the World Cup Stadium. And to keep foreign wizards from finding it, they'll have made it unplottable. Come again? Well, you can enchant a building so it's impossible to plot on a map, can't you? Uh, if you say so, said Harry. But I think Durmstrang must be in the far north, said Hermione thoughtfully. Somewhere very cold, because they've got fur capes as part of their uniforms. Ah, thank you, the possibilities, said Ron dreamily. It would have been so easy to push Malfoy off a glacier and make it look like an accident. Shame his mother likes him. The rain became heavier and heavier as the train moved further north. The sky was so dark and the windows so steamy that the lanterns were lit by midday. The lunch trolley came rattling along the corridor and Harry bought a large stack of cauldron cakes for them to share. Several of their friends looked in on them as the afternoon progressed, including Seamus Finnegan, Dean Thomas, and Neville Longbottom, a round-faced, extremely forgetful boy who had been brought up by his formidable witch of a grandmother. Seamus was still wearing his Ireland rosette, speaking, Troy, Mullet, Moran but in a very feeble and exhausted sort of way. After half an hour or so, Hermione, growing tired of the endless Quidditch talk, buried herself once more in the standard book of spells, grade four, and started trying to learn a summoning charm. Neville listened jealously to the others' conversation as they relived the cup match. Gran didn't want to go, he said miserably. Wouldn't buy tickets. It sounds amazing now. It was, said Ron. Look at this, Neville. He rummaged in his trunk, in the, up in the luggage rack, and pulled out the miniature figure of Victor Crom. Oh, wow, said Neville enviously, as Ron tipped Crom onto his pudgy hand. We saw him right up close as well, said Ron. We were in the top box. For the first and last time in your life, Weasley. Draco Malfoy had appeared in the doorway. Behind him stood Crabbe and Goyle, his enormous thuggish cronies, both of whom appeared to have grown at least a foot during the summer. Evidently, they had overheard the conversation through the compartment door, which Dean and Seamus had left ajar. Don't remember asking you to join us, Malfoy, said Harry coolly. Weasley, what is that, said Malfoy, pointing at Pigwidgeon's cage. A sleeve of Ron's dress robes was dangling from it, swaying with the motion of the train, the moldy lace cuff, very obvious. Ron made to stuff the robes out of sight, but Malfoy was too quick for him. He seized the sleeve and pulled. <gasps> Look at this, said Malfoy in ecstasy, holding up Ron's robes and showing Crab and Goyle. Weasley, you weren't thinking of wearing these, were you? I mean, <laughs> they were very fashionable in about 1890. A dumb Malfoy, said Ron the same color as the dress robes as he snatched them back out of Malfoy's grip. Malfoy howled with derisive laughter. Crab and Goyle guffawed stupidly. So, going to enter, Weasley? Going to try and bring a bit of glory to the family name? There's money involved as well, you know. You'd be able to afford some decent robes if you won. What are you talking about? snapped Ron. Are you going to enter? Malfoy repeated. I suppose you will, Potter. You never miss a chance to show off, do you? Either explain what you're on about or go away, Malfoy, said Hermione testily, over the top of the standard book of spells, grade four. A gleeful smile spread across Malfoy's pale face. 
Don't tell me you don't know, he said delightedly. You've got a father and brother at the ministry and you don't even know? My God, my father told me about it ages ago. Heard it from Cornelius Fudge. But then, father's always associated with the top people at the ministry. Maybe your father's too junior to know about it. Weasley. <laughs> yes, they probably don't talk about important stuff in front of him. <laughs> Laughing once more, Malfoy beckoned to Crabbe and Goyle, and the three of them disappeared. Ron got to his feet and slammed the sliding compartment door so hard behind them that the glass shattered. Ron, said Hermione reproachfully, and she pulled out her wand, muttered, Reparo, and the glass shards flew back into a single pane and then back into the door. Well, Making it look like he knows everything and we don't, Ron snarled. Father's always associated with the top people at the ministry. Dad could have got promotion any time. He just likes it where he is. Of course he does, said Hermione quietly. Don't let Malfoy get to you, Ron. Him get to me? As if, said Ron, picking up one of the remaining cauldron cakes and squashing it into a pulp. Ron's bad mood continued for the rest of the journey. He didn't talk much as they changed into their school robes and was still glowering when the Hogwarts Express slowed down at last and finally stopped in the pitch darkness of Hogsmeade Station. As the train doors opened, there was a rumble of thunder overhead. Hermione bundled Crookshanks up in her cloak and Ron left his dress robes over Pigwidgeon as they left the train. Heads bent and eyes narrowed against the downpour. The rain was now coming down so thick and fast that it was as though buckets of ice-cold water were being emptied repeatedly over their heads. Hi, Hagrid, Harry yelled, seeing a gigantic silhouette at the far end of the platform. All right, Harry! Hagrid bellowed back, waving, See you at the feast if we don't drown! First years traditionally reached Hogwarts Castle by sailing across the lake with Hagrid. Ooh, I wouldn't fancy crossing the lake in this weather, said Hermione fervently, shivering as they inched slowly along the dark platform with the rest of the crowd. A hundred horseless carriages stood waiting for them outside the station. Harry... Ron, Hermione, and Neville climbed gratefully into one of them. The door shut with a snap, and a few moments later, with a great lurch, the long procession of carriages was rumbling and splashing its way up the tracks toward Hogwarts Castle. Chapter 12 The Tri-Wizarding Tournament through the gates, flanked with statues of winged boars, and up the sweeping drive the carriages trundled, swaying dangerously in what was fast becoming a gale. Leaning against the window, Harry could see Hogwarts coming nearer, its many lighted windows blurred and shimmering behind the thick curtain of rain. Lightning flashed across the sky as their carriage came to a halt before the great oak front doors, which stood at the top of a flight of stone steps. People who had occupied the carriages in front were already hurrying up the stone steps into the castle. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville jumped down from their carriage and dashed up the steps too, looking up only when they were safely inside the cavernous torch-lit entrance hall with its magnificent marble staircase. Blimey, said Ron, shaking his head and sending water everywhere. If that keeps up, the lake's going to overflow. I'm so... Ah! A large, red, water-filled balloon had dropped from out of the ceiling onto Ron's head and exploded. Drenched and spluttering, Ron staggered sideways into Harry just as a second water bomb dropped, narrowly missing Hermione. It burst at Harry's feet, sending a wave of cold water over his trainers into his socks. 